El candidato demócrata al Senado de Texas, Beto O'Rourke, se presentó en Navasora como parte de la campaña para la contienda política de noviembre que disputa contra el actual senador Ted Cruz. Beto, como se le conoce al actual representante estatal por el 16 distrito en El Paso, abordó sin temor temas controversiales como inmigración, DACA, veteranos de las Fuerzas Armadas, maestros y respondió preguntas sobre salud y comunidad LGBTQIA. No vamos a descansar hasta que cada niño regrese con sus padres, dijo el aspirante al senador, que se destaca por visitar personalmente los 254 condados que componen el estado, pero también por financiar su campaña política de una manera única, a través de los donativos de la gente, ya que el representante se niega a aceptar dinero de los grandes corporativos que comprometen los votos en las cámaras. My name is John Fultz. I'm the county attorney for Grimes County. We are all in this together. I give to you Beto O'Rourke. Para la comunidad que prefieren hablar o escuchar en español, yo voy a estar en el estado, voy a regresar como senador para que yo pueda ser responsable a la gente que yo quiero representar. Para las quejas, las ideas, las oportunidades, yo pueda entenderlos y hacer el trabajo muy necesario en el senado para que cada persona en cada parte del estado, y no me importa um, si son republicanos o demócratas o independientes, van a tener a alguien que va a luchar por ellos en el Senado. We will not rest until every child is reunited with every parent, and then we decide as a country we will never inflict this kind of cruelty and inhumanity and torture on another human being again. So we've been, um, for the better part of two years, traveling to each one of the 254 counties of Texas, showing up literally everywhere to listen to everyone. Now, this state with 200,000 dreamers Folks whose immigration status is not fixed, who could at any moment, I'm afraid to say, be deported back to a country that they've never really known, whose language they do not speak. It's because of the fact that people have chosen us. They, they want to start a new life in this country, and they've left what's comfortable to them, their family, their community, their country, their culture, their language. They came here, yes to do better for themselves and to do better for their kids, but they also came because they were inspired by this place and they want to contribute to its greatness. That, that's a great, if that's a problem, that's a wonderful problem to have. And, and I would think that whether it's El Paso or Navasota or Houston, this diverse state comprised of the people of the planet should be the one to lead the way on rewriting our immigration laws so they reflect who we are. Now that's Republicans and Democrats and independents doing that together. No one has a monopoly on the great ideas or the path to success, but this state has a set of experiences, um, 28 million strong, that should certainly be leading the conversation and informing the debate. And I also think it's an answer to the smallness, um, the fear, the paranoia that describes so much of our immigration policy today. We can also not be defined by this incredibly cruel, inhumane policy. And if truth be told, um, there is much for those countries to work out, many things for the people living in those countries to do, but the United States is not without culpability over the last 50 years in our involvement in Central America, not without culpability of being 4% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's illegal drug market. Um, we, we have a little bit of ownership in this, and we can try to solve it at our borders, or we can try to work with the countries involved, the people involved, um, civil society involved, to see if we cannot make it better there, so no one has to make that decision again. But here's what we have decided to do instead. And though this is the decision of one person, The President of the United States is something that will define all of us until we make it right. 100% of those families apprehended in between ports of entry in this zero tolerance policy. Um, the babies, the kids, the children taken from those parents. Um, the parents turned over to the Department of Justice, prosecuted like common criminals, turned back over to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and in many cases, hundreds of cases, sent back to the very countries from which they fled without those kids that they risked everything, including their lives for. Those kids, those parents, knowing not when, um, not even if, they're ever going to see each other again. Uh, I guarantee you, and you know this or you wouldn't be here, Our kids, our grandkids, our conscience, history um, is, is going to ask us, 
what, what we did at this moment of truth. And Good afternoon. Uh, I was curious how it feels uh, to have a video go viral and to be retweeted by LeBron James and Ellen DeGeneres and how positively social media can affect your campaign. Yeah. There, there was a video at an education town hall that we had um, and expected questions on um, special education, uh, expected questions on early college, high schools, did not expect a question on um, NFL players who were trying to call attention to the lack of justice and accountability for use of force against unarmed black men, teenagers, and children in communities across the country. And uh, my team can tell you, um, not expecting that question and, and not having been asked that question before, despite the hundreds of town halls that we had, I just spoke from the heart with, with what was on my mind and um, tried to do my best to say that those in law enforcement have among, if not the toughest jobs in our communities. They are absolutely deserving of our respect and of being honored. But those who try to peacefully resolve um, issues of violence non-violently um, through the First Amendment guarantee in the Constitution. The progress that we made has been purchased with lives lost on uh, Omaha Beach, uh, with, with lives lost in Vietnam and Korea in the first Gulf War, and, and unfortunately continue to be lost all over the world. But the only thing for me that was nice about being recognized by, by someone like LeBron James was to call Ulysses at the end of the day and say, hey, Ulysses. <laughs> And, and he, he was uh, unfortunately not impressed. I thought, I finally, I finally did something that my son is going to be proud of. Um, so, no, I, I, I want to make sure that we are focused on, on Texas, on the issues that we bring here today, on serving one another. And, I, and again, I cannot echo the words of the county attorney any uh, more fiercely, that, that we can come to different conclusions on, on, a, on an issue that is potentially contentious like this one, and still accept that you're every bit as American as I am. You love this country every bit as much. Let's hope that we can continue to do that, right? That's the genius of America. I want to ask what you're going to do for Texas in rural areas to support the LGBT community when there's absolutely no help. This is a state, and I didn't know, don't know that I understood this, where it is still lawful to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation when you're hiring, when you're firing. Things got so bad at Child Protective Services not too long ago that kids were sleeping on top of the desks at the CPS office, sleeping under the desks. And yet in Texas, you can literally be too gay to be able to adopt one of those children who needs a loving home under the guise of religious freedom. Um, we can deny that child who needs placement that 40% of homeless youth are LGBT, LGBTQIA. In other words, they, they didn't feel safe at home, couldn't come out to their parents, or their parents kicked them out of the house. Um, the rates of, well, some, some really awful things I, I don't need to go into, but you know where I'm going with this. We should be able to do better for all of us. As, as some say, y'all means all, means every single one of us. So civil rights, equal protection under the law, equal access to opportunity, equal justice under the law. That, that should apply to everyone. And so I'm an original co-sponsor of the Equality Act, which would prevent any state, including Texas, from exempting itself from full civil rights protections for every one of their citizens, including those who may be part of the LGBTQIA community. En los últimos meses he visto yo con mucha atención que vemos más personas de la tercera edad, personas mayores trabajando. Sí. ¿Qué está haciendo el gobierno por ellos? Y un comentario para la gente en español, sí. eh, lo que quiera decir. Well, voy a responder primero en, en español y luego en, en inglés. I'll, I'll answer very quickly in, in Spanish and then in English. Um, necesitamos asegurar el futuro de social security para los que están trabajando en este momento. 
uh, los que han trabajado durante sus vidas y han pagado con sus impuestos en el Social Security Trust Fund. Eh, estamos uh, uno de los miembros del Congreso que apoyan el Social Security 2100 Act. Es un proyecto de ley que va a asegurar uh, ese programa para el futuro y vamos a levanta levantar um, el nivel, the caps, on um, los ingresos en que pagan impuestos para Social Security. Y como eso, para esta generación y las generaciones que vienen, podemos asegurar ese programa. Cuando uh, quieren retirar, uh, pueden vivir vidas con, con dignidad. The question was about Social Security and how do we make sure that Social Security is going to be there in the future for those who are working today. Uh, a study just came out this week, I think, that says along the current trajectory, um, we will not be able to meet 100% of our obligations of working Americans today by the time they retire as soon as 2035, not too far down the road, a little more than 15 years down the road. And so the question is, how do we make sure that, pro that program entered into um, What courage for this country in the midst of the Great Depression, ensuring that everyone who's worked their lives when they retire do not live in poverty. And it has lifted millions out of poverty. I think the poverty rate for those over 65 has gone from 40% in the 1930s to under 10% today. But that program will not last if we don't make changes right now. The wealthiest in this country only pay Social Security taxes on the first $127,000 that they make. Every dime, every dollar, every million dollars over that is not taxed for Social Security purposes, not adding to the trust fund the way that almost everyone else's entire income is taxed for that purpose. If we raise that cap, we will have the resources to assure Social Security's viability for this century and the next century. For this generation and every generation that follows. Thank you for asking the question. Gracias. So we are very, very grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you.